is where we discuss the possibilities. Hey guys, I'm Corey Probst, a health psychologist and wellness director at The Diet Doc, and I'm here with Dr. Joe Klimzeski, founder of The Diet Doc. Welcome back to The Diet Doc Life Mastery Podcast. Hi, Joe. How are you? I am awesome. Thanks. Every time you say welcome back, I, I want to say, oh, hey, glad I'm here. And I forget you're talking to other people. It's not just you and me. <laughs> it is just you and me here. I can't <laughs> see everyone else. But, uh, so we're in the fourth segment of this series on I want to eat like a normal person. And we're talking about how to move from food fear to food freedom. And what I've described so far, if those of you who haven't tuned in to the first three segments of this, I've kind of broken it down into this four-legged stool model. And so food freedom, the four legs are macronutrients, metabolism, mindfulness, and moralization. And today we're discussing mindfulness. You, you game, Joe? For yeah. And I would just uh, like to, again, give you some credit for putting a new spin on all of those. So talking about metabolism as more of a mental metabolism, talking about macronutrients, it was more of having a macro perspective about macronutrients. So looking, looking forward to see what you can do with mindfulness and make it something different. Yeah, thank you for that review. Um, it, it needed to be looked at in a different way because I think we're all conditioned at this point to hear those words and just immediately attach to this one concept. So in the spirit of opening up our minds, which is something that we really want to help our clients do, right? See things from new perspectives. That was one of my goals in conveying this information differently. So thank you. Mm -hmm. Ready to go. All right. So with mindfulness, perhaps it would just be good to begin with a definition. And so mindfulness is a non-judgmental awareness of the present moment as it is. And I see this as incredibly important because when we're talking about body image, when we're talking about eating, when we're talking about food, when we're talking about weight loss, what I find is that a lot of our clients are living in the past and they're living far, far into the future and being right here right now and accepting and compassionate of what is occurring in the moment. I don't want to say, well, I will say that it's not common <laughs> and that it's not necessarily a skill that a lot of people have developed or maybe even understand to be an available skill to build. So I think a lot of people have heard of mindfulness, but the question that I get a lot of times is what is that? <laughs> How do I do it? Well, you know, I, I want to call a timeout for a second because you know, I, I've heard you say this a million times and I always stop on that term, a non-judgmental, because you're right, it's so not what we do. Our brains aren't, aren't uh, even capable of not judging unless we stop and force it in that environment. So, uh, you know, just, just, just to really zero in on that for a second, mindfulness is a non-judgmental awareness. So you have to be open-minded. You have to just say, I'm just going to sit here for a second and look at whatever this context is from all angles, open-minded, and not give it a value statement. That's, that's incredibly hard. Yes. It's a practice. It literally is because we're not used to doing that. We dichotomize things. It's good or bad. It's always or never. It's high. It's low. <laughs> mm -hmm. And so it's that middle ground and that in between and the gray area where we can build more skillful means for being. I mean, I don't know another, a better way to say it, but to be. 
rather than to have to grasp for it to be a different way or to push whatever is there away or to avoid. That's, that's our real habitual tendency is to push away or to cling. Mm -hmm. So if I'm going to do neither, if I want to eat like a normal person, how do I, how do, I do that in terms of being non-judgmentally aware? What do I do? So I think one of the best things that we can do is to begin to practice mindful eating. Let's put this in the sphere of eating again and food. And part of it is to begin getting in touch with our bodies as well. We're really good at looking at our bodies, but not necessarily paying attention to what's occurring inside of them. Um, but so mindful eating can move us into a space where we're connecting with our bodies. We're connecting with what's going on in our heads. We're connecting with the food that's in front of us. And this is especially important is we're connecting with what's beyond all of those things. So let me, that probably sounds very confusing, but what I'd like to do is give everyone a few tips that they can begin incorporating on a daily basis to practice mindfulness while they're eating. One of them, Joe, would be to seek out a quiet spot to eat. So all of us, <laughs> most of us, we don't do this deliberately. We're eating while we're driving. We're eating while we're watching TV. We're eating while we're trying to work and, and answer emails. We're eating while we're listening to a podcast. Whatever it is, we are trying to eat and do other stuff. And so you think about it. When you're eating and doing other things, are you paying attention and letting your attention land on this food in my mouth right now, savoring the texture or the flavor or the smell of that food? Or in that moment, are you in your body and saying, gosh, that I've had a few bites now and it feels like it's just sitting in my gut right now. That doesn't feel very good. Or say that you're really hungry. And in most cases like that, people are just they're shoving food in their face as fast as they can to try to feel better. But in that moment, if we were to slow down and pause, like you said, find that quiet spot, not when everything else is going on around us, and take a few deep breaths first and then eat a bite and then have another bite, but then be like, wow, I can actually feel my energy rising now and coming back as opposed to you getting done at, you know, with the meal and being like, where'd my food go? And having no awareness at all of what's occurring in the body. And you just described how I eat to a T. Uh, but I, I can say that when I'm somewhere and the meal is the focus, it is exactly how you say it and drastically different. Yeah. Uh, you know, eating in the car, eating in front of the TV, eating from the computer, all of that is exactly how most of my meals are, are set up. Mm -hmm. But we talked about, I think it was yesterday or the, the previous podcast about cultural differences in how, you know, maybe people in Europe really focus on the meal itself as something other than just that food, you know, those macronutrients. And, um, you know, it's, well, that's, what, that's, that's one of the reasons I was going to say, I, I, you know, Anthony Bourdain became so successful in, in his show, you know, went on for a decade was he brought more to it than just a food show. And it wasn't just about a chef. It was about culture and anthropology and people. And if we take that into as many meals as we can with anybody who's around us, you know, I, I mentioned that a, a while ago I tried to start setting up one lunch a week that was with somebody else, right? I actually leave my office, which I haven't done probably, you know, five times in 20 years. And, and how remarkable that feels just to break that pattern and start making a meal more about just shoving food in your mouth. Yeah, I, I like that you are aware enough to kind of take stock of how you were doing things currently 
and to ask, is there something else that I could do to learn something new about someone else and combine it with maybe a more mindful meal? I, I think that I, it also, it will, I think it'll help people to just pick one meal or one snack per day to practice this with. And the other thing that I would say is <laughs> I want to remind you to be compassionate with yourself and because it may not feel very easy to do this initially. You may sit down and that's another tip that I would recommend. Stop eating standing up. <laughs> You're killing me, man. You're killing me. I know. You're standing up at your desk <laughs> all day long and the, you're doing things at the same time, but there's no body awareness there. There's no appreciation of the food really. And there might be, but it's going to be like small blips on your radar before your attention shifts again to the other thing that you're doing. So sitting down, seeking out a quiet spot, incorporating three deep breaths before you even take your first bite. Because typically we're moving directly from one thing right into a meal and we're not allowing ourselves that space or that pause to shift our energy. And we're typically running, we're going, we're in like high anxiety mode, got to get it done, got to get it done. And that's not, <laughs> that's not an optimal emotional space to be in when we're eating, even for digestion. Um, let's go back to cult culturally speaking, you were in Italy and I, I lived there for a couple of years. I remember what the meals were like and the meals were an event. We would sit down, you know, we were with other people. The, yes, the food was very important and it was slow. It wasn't rushed. Um, and all of those things are very important factors in terms of incorporating a level of mindfulness and appreciation for what's in front of us right now. The other piece of this is, and this isn't attached to weight loss at all, although it could be, but we tend to eat less when we're paying more attention to how this food feels in our bodies and when we can appreciate what's in it, how it's affecting us, how it's nourishing us. Because if we're eating just voraciously and shoving it in our faces trying to get to the next thing, we're probably going to eat more calories. And well, research has actually shown that we do. That's what I was going to say. I, I have to assume there's some good research, not just on eating slowly, because you, you, there is, uh, I, I know, study after study on how many times you chew your food and all that, but just in how you view food as satisfying, there has to be a correlation to how long between meals you go, or uh, just the person, like, let's say I have a habit of, I go home and I hit the kitchen. The first thing I do is open up the cupboard and I'm looking for chips or something. Whereas my wife is much more content to get something out. You know, she'll spend an hour making a meal just, and, and she may be starving because it's after work for her too, but she still takes that time because she values that meal. And I'm sitting there just eating shit out of a bag. And so what's so interesting about this? There's, there's, two things there. I'm the same way as Tracy in that regard, but there is a male and female difference in terms of how you guys just do things in general. When you get to the point of this is, I'm, I'm up here now mm. and this needs to be solved right now. Um, where we're, as females, just a bit more attuned to everything else that's going on, who else needs to be taken care of, what else needs to be taken care of. And so that would be a really fun podcast too, male-female differences. And <laughs> that, that model, I was speaking of just evolutionary biology, that model is consistent all the way through the animal kingdom, even among the, the rare few animals that can switch sexes. You can be a female, then a male, then a male, you know, back and forth. And, and when you have those higher levels of estrogen, decreased levels of testosterone, all of that flips. So, yeah, <laughs> you know, all, all of the, the sexism of the day aside, that's just true biology.
Well, the funny thing is, like, I may be in the kitchen. I'm hungry. Like, it's been four hours since I've eaten lunch. I'm making dinner. Dinner's halfway done. And I'm like, I'm not going to eat until the whole thing is done. And then Ben and I can eat together, right? Ben comes in, mm -hmm. comes over to the still, <laughs> starts shoving food in his face. And any, any woman would understand this. You're like, I've just been putting all this work into a really nice meal. I haven't even tasted it yet. And now you're shoving it in your pie hole. Like, could you not just wait five more minutes? But that is literally, it's a difference in the brain. I'm mm -hmm. up here. I'm freaking starving. This is the only thing that needs to be taken care of right now. I'm going to eat. It doesn't have anything to do with him being disrespectful of me cooking his meal or <laughs> it's not that at all. But yeah, it's, it's very funny. That's, that's why mindfulness has to incorporate a pause. You have to say, okay, this is, this is what everything in my biology and psychology is driving me forward. Now I need to say, wait a second, is that the right move that I want to make? Yes, that is an awesome point. Thank you. Yep. Because mindfulness, it, it, the non-judgmental word is, I think, the most imperative. Because it literally, if you start paying attention to your thoughts about your coworker or the experience you just had or the workout that you just got finished with, there's going to be a judgment that wasn't good enough, that person was rude or mean, her skirt was ugly. I mean, <laughs> it could be super trivial, but it's really not trivial because the more you do it, the more habitual it becomes. And no one wants to be labeled as a judgmental person. That's not a compliment, guys. <laughs> so, okay, back to some more mindful eating tips. I wanted to stay right there. I wanted to keep going <laughs> the, the social psychology. That's super fun stuff to talk about. <laughs> why are we, why do we do what we do? Uh, I, I will say one more thing, then we can go back. Yeah. Uh, you know, that is studied. I've read so many, so many articles about this. To, to be the most attractive quality of a human being is when you are non judgmental, yeah. when you are positive yeah. and inclusive that makes you the most attractive person in a group. And as soon as you are judgmental or talking about somebody else with any negativity, you are at the bottom of the pile, right? You are totally unattractive. People turn their attention away from you to move more toward those individuals who bring the, the energy level in the room up. Yes. Yeah. What, what, an, what an indictment for us just to work on that. <laughs> as a yeah, so what, because we have to eat, right? What a great place to begin practicing a non-judgmental awareness. Let's not judge the food. Let's practice not judging our bodies. Let's practice not judging the emotions that we're experiencing. Let's really get in touch with whether we're clinging or grasping for something not to change or trying to avoid and resist and push away what is occurring and breathe and pause and be open to whatever's happening right now. No judgment. This is, reality is reality. I heard someone recently describe this very nicely and let's see if I don't mess it up. It, it will make complete sense, Joe, when you hear it, but we are a product of just a, layers and layers and layers of conditioning, okay? conditioning that has created beliefs and biases and opinions and judgments and we're born perfect we are we're literally perfect when we're born we have all that crap piled up on top of us it's not all crap a lot of the things that we begin to believe are super generative but when we when we see that we're clinging or we're pushing and avoiding a lot of things away and really doing a lot of complaining and judging, we can always come back to the fact that our, our innate nature is really that we're loving, we're compassionate, we're affiliative, we want to connect with people, we want to understand, we want to love, and that's already inside of us. But it's all of the experiences that we've had and the things that people have told us and 
the criticisms that maybe we've weathered and the trauma that we've gone through that is just layered and layered and layered and layered. And so this is practicing mindfulness is really beginning to peel back layer by layer by layer by layer layer to get to what's really here right now. Well said. Yeah. Perfect. Thank you. Yeah. That just, it gives me peace <laughs> when I think of it that way. Um, so a few more ideas when you're eating, put down your utensil after each bite, because that will help you to pause and be more aware of the bite that you're currently eating. If you're eating a taco <laughs> or a burrito or something, you don't have a utensil, put the food down. <laughs> Chew each bite completely. Joe, you probably are like Ben in this regard where you're just like, yeah. the bite's only halfway done and it's not down your throat yet and you're already taking the next one. And I, and I just ate fish tacos the other night and I specifically remember not putting it down because <laughs> it takes so much work to hold it together in the first place. And I'm like, I'm not going to put this down. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try and get this whole thing in my mouth as fast as I can just so I don't lose it. <laughs> I... I want to the next time we're all together and you and Ben are eating. I, I'm just going to record it. Just going to record right. <laughs> He, I love the way that he eats burritos. It's not the way that I would eat a burrito by any means, but it's like, I have thought, are you an ape? Yeah. There's me judging the way he's eating his burrito. The, the answer is yes, but yeah, I, I understand like the whole backhoe like mentality just... The, the, it's, it's the least amount of work. It's like, how, how efficiently can I just move this food from here into here? And then we can move on. We can do something else. We were at the dinner table last night and I'm just watching him and I'm getting anxious watching him because he's eating so fast. I'm like, I will be through my third bite and you're going to be done with your meal. <laughs> I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to find some obscure research that shows that it's okay. Like, we can eat this way and it's okay. But It is okay. Like, and that's what I tell Non-judgmental. It's okay. He can eat that way if he wants to. And it really doesn't affect me. Or it doesn't have to affect me. Mm. I can eat my way and he can eat his way. And I can admire just the... I will sit in awe and <laughs> watch <laughs> How much and how fast food can we put away? Watch this eating frenzy take place. But the, you know, again, the greatest point I think you've made about being mindful in terms of eating like a normal person is first we have to define what normal is going to be. And I think we can all create some kind of utopic version of, well, if I had, if I had to pick my normal way of eating, it would be somebody who does enjoy their food who looks at it with greater value, who isn't just always in a hurry. So, I mean, you really have captured it well, Corey, and I think that's, that's an important thing is this is not just about losing weight or you know, macronutrients and your health. It's, it's truly about the, this thing that we're going to do several times a day every day, eating, and, and how do we incorporate that to be a happier, healthier person? Uh, absolutely. And to remember and accept and acknowledge that no, not every meal is going to be like this, guys. And it doesn't mean you're not doing it, quote unquote, right, or you're bad because every meal isn't mindful. It's just, let's begin to incorporate this into our lives because it's going to filter into every other area of your life, in your relationships and your career and how you're interacting with your coworkers or your children or your partner. Um, the part about this that we didn't talk about, Joe, was how mindful eating can help us get more in touch with our senses. So when you're focusing, for example, on just that one bite and not shoving another one in your face really fast, um, bringing your attention to, okay, what are the flavors in this meal? In this one bite, what do I actually taste? And go there. Or go to, what are the scents that I'm what am I getting here in terms of how this meal smells? No, I, when I was visiting my mom recently, um, she'd made lasagna and Ben was like, 
this is the one moment where I'm like, oh my gosh, he's truly being mindful while we're eating. He was like, there is some ingredient in here that I can't, I can't pinpoint what it is. And I don't know if it's an Italian spice or, and he's like, he's savoring that one bite. Like he's not chomping. And so that's what I mean, guys, is appreciating what's there and actually getting into that sense right there in the moment to see what, what do you find with no judgment, but just curiosity. Let's bring that word back into our meals. Can I be curious? And then, so the senses, you guys know the five senses. The other part about this is connecting to a larger whole. Let's go back to macronutrients. Look at this from the big picture. Your meal in front of you isn't just the meal in front of you. How did it get to you? Yeah, maybe you cooked it, but where'd the food come from? Someone had to grow it. <laughs> And then someone had to pick it. Someone had to nurture it to grow in the first place. Someone had to pack it up. Someone had to actually drive the train or the truck or however that food was going to get to you. Someone had to build the factory that that food was made in. So it, it can be a great way to begin to appreciate everyone and everything that has been involved in this meal nourishing you right now. What's, what's interesting about that, Corey, is I've, I've come to look at what you described in terms of food taste and the complexity of your palate yeah. as a hobby because I used to, almost as a badge of honor, uh, take pride in the fact that I didn't care about food. It, it's, it's still somewhat true. I mean, you could put a $1,000 steak in front of me or a you know, a $2 steak, and I would probably not be able to tell them apart. But as you said, to start appreciating uh, the differences and the nuances, again, makes you focus your attention on exactly that. And everything you just went through, that entire litany of just social awareness was, was incredibly uh, provoking. I mean, I think that's something to really consider. Yeah, thank you. I, it's not an experience that most people have had. And so I would encourage everyone to try it. And um, it really relates to, in mindfulness, we also talk about loving kindness, where we extend love and we extend kindness to people beyond ourselves. You know, we talk a lot about self-compassion, but <clears throat> for us to begin acknowledging that there's a lot of pain and suffering in the world, and we're not the only ones who want to lose weight and we're striving for greater health and we're not the only ones who struggle with eating or emotional eating, and we're not the only ones who are struggling with looking at our bodies and not being happy and who are practicing, you know, less body shame and guilt. Um, and so when we can learn and remember that we are all in this together, we are not the only ones suffering, that this is a common humanity, food can really help us practice that. Absolutely. And uh, thank you, Dr. Propes, for another great series in your motivational mastery topic. Uh, I think this one is going to be uh, one for the ages, talking about the moralization, the macro perspective of macronutrients, mm -hmm. the metabolic, um, metabolism. Me mental me metabolism, yes. And now, of course, mindfulness. So excellent, excellent work. And uh, again, we always thank you guys for your attention because we wouldn't do this if you weren't listening. I don't think. Uh, maybe we still <laughs> we can try that sometime, Corey. Just not record and see if we have the same, same good conversations. But thank you guys. And we'll be back next time for some macro mastery. We're going to get back into the science or fiction category. And we're lighting up some coaches for our coaching clinic. So stay tuned. Thanks, guys. <laughs>